I'm Beatriz, and I'll be talking to you about reason receptivity, um, which is which is one of the criteria for um, moral responsibility, right, um, and for control, and especially John Martin Fisher's philosophy. So um, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present more of a project um, than actually conclusions. So I think there is an, an issue with um, the requirements that Fisher um, provides us. And I hope that I can show you the problem and that we can discuss it a little bit. Um, maybe, maybe you guys can um, give me suggestions and um, we can talk about it a little bit. So let me start by, um, oh wait, it's like super slow. Okay, um, so let me start by um, really um, swiftly pointing out what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna clarify a bit control and moral responsibility. Um, really fast, I'll go over reason receptivity. Some cases that I consider defying for this account and why they're defying, and then I'll try to formulate the, the problem. So, okay. Um, so here we're working in a specific framework, which is the framework for control and more responsibility formulated by John Martin Fisher and Mark Raviza. Um, so they're working with semi-compatibilism, which does not require the falsity of determinism in order for an agent to be um, morally responsible for her action. So they don't require alternative possibilities. Um, what they actually think is um, relevant is control. And this is their condition for more responsibility, but not just any control. They're talking about guidance control, which is um, the kind of control that you have when, so this is um, Fisher's, um, <laughs> This is Fisher's uh, example. Um, when you're driving a car and you steer to the left, then you're, um, you're actually, um, you're, the car is gonna uh, turn to the left if you're controlling it. Um, this is opposed to when, you're, when you get to a crossroad and you can turn to the left or turn to the right. That is control when um, the agent has alternative possibilities. So they specify a little bit more um, what they mean by guidance control by giving us some requirements for it. Um, the first requirement is the mechanism that issues the action must be reason responsive. And that's the epistemic criteria, right? Um, that um, I, I'm saying correct criteria because it's gonna break down in two or three aspects. Um, and it's kind of vague what they mean by mechanism. Um, what they mean is just the way in which um, the action is issued, and that's super vague. So what we're gonna think about is, um, we're gonna think that it's a process, right? And it's still gonna be vague, but we're not gonna focus on that here today. Um, so that breaks down in the agent being reactive to reasons, and that means that the agent must choose according to her reasons to act, as well as her um, capacity to act according to her choice. Um, but that's not all. Um, the agent must also be receptive to reasons. The agent must be able to recognize sufficient, and they're particularly concerned with moral reasons, so sufficient reasons to act, um, especially moral reasons to act. And the second requirement is that the mechanism that issues the action must be the agent's own. So we won't look too much into this other requirement either um, because it's mostly concentrated in preempting manipulation. And this is the kind of manipulation that is involved in, um, you know, philosophical thought experiments in which you have a neuroscientist who is, um, tweaking in someone's brain, brain activity or something like that, or you have an alien microchip that has been installed and it's now controlling the agent's behavior. So um, if, the, if the mechanism isn't the agent's own, then of course um, she's not morally responsible for, for her behavior. Um, okay, 
So I went over that fast and we're moving on to reason receptivity. So reason receptivity is what I'm actually concerned about um, today. And that just means that um, we want to know um, whether the agent recognizes the reasons that exist for acting. So Fisher doesn't exactly organize this in requirements like this, but um, reading all the, that he thinks that is important to have reason receptivity, I organize them in terms of um, requirements. So the mechanism or the process that issues the action must show a pattern of reason recognition. So this mechanism is usually uh, practical reasoning. So it will be a practical reasoning process that issues the action, and it must be um, a mechanism that, is, that shows a pattern of reason recognition that is regularly receptive to reasons. So say the agent um, usually is capable of um, practical reasoning in an efficient way. So the second requirement is um, adds to the first. So the pattern of reason recognition must be understandable by a third party. So it, it's not enough for the pattern to be understandable by the agent herself. It's, it's not just a subjective question. A third party must be able to understand that pattern. Um, and to take into consideration, the, and they must do this being able to take into consideration the agent's subject, subjective features like preferences, beliefs, values. And so this third party should be able to pick out what constitutes sufficient reason for the agent's action. So um, summarizing, the reason must relate to each other, right? They, the agent has reasons to act, but they relate to each other in an understandable way. Um, to form a comprehensible pattern. And then finally, these reasons must be grounded in reality, for the agent might have coherent reasons um, that form an understandable pattern, but still not grounded in reality. So the agent might be substantially deluded about reality. So what I think are the fine cases um, for these requirements? Um, I think, um, well, I'm going to start talking about epistemic dishonesty, which isn't really a, a defined case, but it's just to set the tone. So when I'm talking about epistemic dishonesty, I'm just think, thinking about a simple case in which an agent is lied to. So maybe an agent is victim of lies or omissions. For instance, um, one might be asked to sign a petition um, in the street, right? And this petition is, for instance, against a, a war, some war that the agent thinks is biased in some ways, for instance, against a religious group or something like that. Um, so the, the agent might read the cover of the petition and say, oh, okay, I'm against this, I'll sign. But it's a deception. The cover is bogus. The, the signatures will actually be attached to a different petition, which is actually for the war. So this agent has been um, deceived, right? So she's the victim of epistemic dishonesty. Um, another case, which gets a little bit more interesting, is um, the case of epistemic bubbles. So um, an epistemic bubble here, I'm thinking about your Facebook feed, where, um, as we know, an algorithm selects what we're going to get in the feed. Um, according to what it has decided are our preferences. So it's a socio-epistemic structure from which other relevant voices have been left out. So what is going on is that um, maybe uh, views that you don't necessarily agree with are not showing up on your Facebook feed because of the algorithm select selection. So if we want to use like a uh, recent context, um, something that's going on now. Um, you think about the U.S. election and you might be getting on your feed um, more, um, more posts from people who are Democratic, for instance, than Republican. Um, the other case I think it's even more interesting is a case of echo chambers. So 
Echo chambers are even um, more concerning because it's a social epistemic structure from which other relevant voices are purposefully kept out through exclusion or discredit. So this is not a case where accidentally you're not seeing some stuff on your Facebook feed. Um, we might question whether it's accidentally because the algorithm is actually working on it. But um, in echo chambers, what you have is purposeful exclusion. So um, there, some voices are not being heard or discredited. So I'm thinking about flat earthers or anti-vaxxers who might um, be discredit discrediting um, scientists who um, argue that um, vaccination is important or that the earth is, is round or um, something of the sort because um, they discredit actually their intentions. They're saying, no, they're working with some sort of agenda um, to trick us all into believing that the earth is not flat for some reason. Um, so they're doubting the intentions of um, these dissident voices. Um, I think it gets even more troublesome when we start thinking about ideology. And here I'm going to use the concept by Jason Stanley in How Propaganda Works. And um, what he says is that ideology is a belief structure constituted by the record of expectations of various goods built out of regularities of convention. They are the beliefs that unreflectedly guide our path through the social world. In this sense, everyone in the world has an ideology since everyone has a social world. So what he's saying is that um, we go through life with um, a series of expectations about what we should get and what our rights should be and um, what, are we, what we are entitled to. And this is based on ideological belief which are beliefs connected to our identity, our social identity, our social practices. And they're quite resistant to rational revision in the face of counter evidence. So everybody has an ideology. And in some sense, um, we might think that these are epistemically flawed, but um, he is concerned about a specific kind of ideology, the flawed ideology, which according to him, are the kind of ideologies that um, prevent us from gaining knowledge about features of reality. And that includes social reality. So one of his examples is um, when, when slavery was legal in the US, um, it was a belief that the people who were enslaved were naturally fit for slavery. So this was a white, widespread belief in the antebellum South because those who challenged it were sanctioned. White children in the South were raised with the belief from birth. Debate about it was prevented. If debate with others is prevented, it is hard to revise a belief. Structural features of society can inhibit rational revision of belief to, be, to preserve desirable so outcomes really yeah. for a group privileged by that structure. So, what you would have would be um, the structure being then um, preserved. So why do I think that these cases might be defined to Fisher's um, requisites for more responsibility, the, epi uh, the epistemic requisites? Because I think that they fail to fulfill one of the criteria at least. Um, so the first one that the mechanisms or processes of practical reasoning that issue the action, um, that, that these uh, mechanisms should show a pattern of reason recognition, I think um, they do pass, like a victim of epistemic dishonesty or, or a person who is in an epistemic bubble or an echo chamber or in a flawed ideology, they don't necessarily have anything wrong with their practical reasoning mechanism. Um, it seems to work in other contexts, in other situations that they're involved in. Also, the pattern must be understandable by a third party. Um, and if we remember from the, the previous slide, um, the pattern should be understandable by a third party, taking in consideration the agent's values, beliefs, and preferences. So if we consider what they believe, their values, their, their preferences, then yeah, there is an understandable pattern 
of reasons for action here. Um, further, um, reasons must be grounded in reality. And this is where I think things go a little bit um, wrong because the agent might have a coherent reason, a uh, pattern of reasons, um, but still not grounded in reality. And I think this is the case with um, these, these um, examples I've been giving. For instance, uh, the person who signed the, the petition, the, vi the victim of epistemic dishonesty, um, she, she just acted and we might say that um, she acted in a morally re reproachable way, right? She signed the petition um, favoring a war against a certain group of people because of their religious beliefs. Um, yes, this seems is, sorry, morally, five minutes. Okay, this seems morally re reproachable. But, um, but her belief wasn't really grounded in reality, right? Um, there was someone who was deceiving her. So we don't usually attribute moral responsibility to this person. And I think that's okay. Um, but when we, we turn to epistemic bubbles and echo chambers, they also don't seem, don't seem to act based on beliefs that are grounded in reality. For instance, um, the person in the Facebook epistemic bubble might choose not to go vote um, for the Democratic Party because everybody in her feed is saying they're voting for the Democrats. So she's like, um, maybe I don't need to go, right? I mean, Trump's not going to win. Um, there, are all, all Demo there are Democrats everywhere. Um, <laughs> and then we might say, what? You didn't go vote. Um, so we, we seem to reproach this person later. Um, on the echo chamber, the same, like um, if you have an anti-vaxxer who won't take her child to get vaccinated, um, we might consider that a morally reproachable option. And um, I, I think the same thing with, with a person who, um, who was a slave owner or something of the sort, right? And in the example given by Stanley. Um, so uh, Fisher claims that delusional psychotics are not receptive to reasons, but are they the only ones? Um, in general, I don't think we attribute more responsibility to victims of epistemic dishonesty. Um, and that does seem reasonable in most cases. But this changes with epistemic bubbles, um, echo chambers, and people who are um, in flawed or have flawed ideologies. We do seem to, in general, hold them responsible to varying degrees. So um, my point is, they fulfill Fisher, they fail to fulfill Fisher and Habeas criteria for um, more responsibility, but um, we still seem to hold them somewhat responsible. So should we? And here is my hypothesis, and this is the work in, in progress that I'm, I'm actually going to start soon. Um, and the hypothesis that I think might be a, a trail to follow right now, and I'm not sure about it, um, this is something open to discussion, is that the answer will vary case by case. Um, for many cases, the answer will be yes, we should hold them responsible. Maybe for um, cases of epistemic bubbles or um, echo chambers in general, because in the past, they took some epistemic steps to get themselves into their epistemic situation. And Fisher, for instance, he holds a historical uh, a view of more responsibility. So the history of the, action, of the action production is relevant to whether we attribute more responsibility to an agent or not. I think it gets trickier when we, when we talk about flawed ideologies because um, I'm not quite sure um, there is something in the past that this person failed to do, the agent. So perhaps if confronted with, with criticism, they retain a flawed ideology, not because of good epistemic practices, but in their own self-interest. Um, so what I'm thinking is that um, Fisher's um, requirements for more responsibility, the epistemic requirements, need to be rethought, especially the last one, the third, um, that talks about grounds and reality. 
I believe that, um, sure, having beliefs grounded in reality is important, but the past um, of the of the agents, um, the agents' epistemic past, perhaps, is important in this in this discussion about whether we still hold her responsible or not. So I hope I was clear about um, the path, the, the track that I'm following here. I thank you all for listening, and um, I welcome questions. Thanks, Beatriz. Uh, any questions? Uh, Felipe Nogueira. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, Bia. Thank you hey. for your presentation. Um, my internet, my connection is not so great right now, so in case I, I cannot uh, get the question out, I'll just try to write it. But uh, one question that I'm interested in is not you know, in particular to your uh, framework or the framework that you use, but in general, uh, the relation between the cognitive biases and responsibility. So um, no, we know that we have you know, many cognitive biases at work, like we rely on certain heuristics and not you know, always uh, reliable or trustworthy. And so how do you think uh, these cognitive biases would fit into this framework or the path that you want to, to pursue? You know, what, what, uh, I don't know, what, what kind of thoughts do you have about that? Um, okay, so what I've realized reading um, this kind of literature is that um, a lot of what is taken into consideration are um, good epistemic practices. So something like um, how, how well the agent um, checks all her beliefs and whether they are appropriate beliefs. Um, they don't seem to take into consideration um, less conscious, I guess, um, aspects of our deliberation. So for instance, they don't seem to take into consideration um, stuff like Joel Proust's um, Investigate, which is just how other factors that aren't um, cognitively available or conscious to us um, help in the formation of our beliefs. And of course, cognitive biases are um, those kinds of cases. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure we're gonna, I'm not sure that I'm gonna go down a path where I'm gonna actually claim that people are um, responsible for their cognitive biases um, at the point of their formation, but maybe there will be some responsibility if these cognitive biases remain unchecked because um, when you, when you um, come across new information about it, for instance, um, so there are a lot of cognitive biases about uh, women and the place we think women should occupy in society. So I'm not sure we can hold people responsible for having those cognitive biases as it is, but once they become aware of it and they can check on it, um, perhaps we can start attributing some responsibility for that, but I'm still not sure. <laughs> Okay, there is a big question here from yep. Rafael Vogelmann. It seems to me that the mere possibility of highly immoral actions poses a problem for Fisher's view. Unless you accept a strong form of reason internalism, it seems reasonable to claim that, say, a desire to hurt others does not give you reason to do so. It also seems reasonable to say that you have good reasons not to hurt others. Therefore, one who hurts another person out of perverse desire is failing to respond to the reasons there are for one to act. Perhaps one is responding to apparent or illusory reasons. It seems to follow that this person is not responsible. Of course, you could say that she is re reason responsive in general, even though she fails to respond to reason in this particular case. But if reason responsiveness in general is enough, can't we say the same for the cases you presented? Well, or could you claim that this, the kind of epistemic challenge you represented impair reason responsive responsiveness in general? Um, I don't think it impairs reason responsiveness in general quite well. I think it's, it's the contrary that's going on. I think these people are reason responsive, even though they don't necessarily fit Fisher's criteria. But um, I, I, 
I fail to um, dig deeper in this point, but um, Fisher isn't just concerned about reasons in general. He's concerned about moral reasons. So in order to be a moral agent to whom we will attribute moral responsibility, um, one needs to be able to recognize um, not only just reasons, but um, more reasons as well. So one needs to be able to uh, understand that other people have claims to, they have their own rights and their, their claims to be um, not mistreated or um, not um, hurt by other people. So um, being able to recognize reasons involve being able to recognize that there are other moral agents in the world with whom you should interact and, and um, that they provide, I guess, good reasons for not behaving in that way, like not hurting other people. Um, so he'll go on and consider cases like psychopaths and, and children, very small children, who perhaps aren't capable of recognizing this kind of reasons. But um, I suppose that competent adults would be held, held accountable for, it, for that kind of behavior. Uh, Nara, you, you, we have time yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was great. Uh, I just uh, would like to ask you to recap a little bit of the end of your presentation, if you, if you can do that. And I'd like to know your opinion about, so what, ha what occurred to me during your presentation were those legal cases in which a person cannot just say, I didn't know, right? The person is responsible for knowing something. So if she takes action it, based on a, a wrong information, it's her responsibility. And I would like to know your stand on that. What, how do you think this would influence your, your view or the development of your research? Okay. Um, so I'm not quite sure yet, but um, if we have, if we accept, and I seem inclined right now to accept that um, moral responsibility um, has to take in, into account the history of the action, then in the history of your formation of, of action, say, um, you do something dangerous that you knew better, you knew that um, could provoke an accident or something like that. Say you go um, drinking and driving is an example, right? <laughs> so I think Fisher talks about this. Um, you go drinking and driving and um, when you cause an accident, then um, maybe you're not, you're not really in a situation that you're very, um, not even receptive to reason, but reactive to, re to reasons in, in general. Um, but there was some point in the formation of, in the history of your action, some point where you put yourself in that position to um, not be reactive to reasons. So this was your own doing. You chose to drink knowing that it would put you in a dangerous position um, because you had to drive afterwards. So I would say that you would still have more responsibility for the action cause, or at least it seems right now. Uh, sorry, Nitamar, we don't have <laughs> more time, nor Katarina, but uh, Beatriz, you can answer then the chat. They made. Uh, thanks again. Thank you all. Uh,